Carr did. He makes this model of that he calls canalization where he thinks that you become too resistant to change, too stuck in a way of thinking, habits, behavior, and that with these drugs, you recalibrate the mind, you get a reset. And it's a, it's a form of uh, hyper stress, a hyper stress situation where you then improve learning. And I think that can be true in, what, in some depressions, in some mental disorders. But the funny thing with psychedelic uh, uh, therapy, which is, so why it's so important and so interesting is that this is, this is the only drug, the only psychopharmaca that we've found that works transdiagnostically, which means, you know, until now we have one drug for depression, one drug for, for alcoholism, one for addiction, uh, for smoking cessation. You know, this drug has proven to work in OCD, in smoking cessation, in, uh, in, in other addictions, in PTSD, major results on, on depression, on anxiety, on death anxiety, and that we've never seen before, and not the results we're seeing. We're talking a remission rate of depression up to 80%. 85% same in smoking cessation same in 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 death anxiety and this is this is unprecedented these are not results that we've ever seen before if, uh, done you know replicated done in different labs with different people and not just short term like we talked about with uh, Robert Whitaker with the antidepressants. I mean, not only are we unable to get a result, a remission rate for more than one in three at best, at worst one in seven, these results are long lasting. These are people who are still well 14 months later and with antidepressant therapy, at best we can say, okay, remission still after six weeks. This is, we've only been able to, to get short term results on antidepressants. So that's why this is so astonishing. There's something that's been getting a lot of attention lately and that is the dramatic effect lifestyle and exercise have on our well-being and mental health. But the difficult thing is to stick with the routine. So what you need to do is to go and check out Pitch Fitness Center. It's a premium wellness gym and it's gorgeous. It gives you that hotel spa feeling with every exercise and their kids club is even open on Sunday. So head on over to pitch.ch that's pitch.ch and get a discount with our promo code psychobabble podcast today. See you there. So the question is what are these enduring changes? Why is it working so well? Because, f for example, fluvoxamine, which is a, a classic SSRI, works on some of the same receptors that they're saying psilocybin works on, and it has never generated these sort of results. So I I doubt that that's that's all, and also this that we're seeing this transdiagnostic effect is also a sign that there's that the the effect is in the psychological change. So what is that? What are the clinical trial patients saying? And and this is interesting. They they're they're using the same words. They're using the same words to describe the experience. There's a pattern in what they're saying. They all say that they've had this mystical experience. And uh, Roland Griffiths talks about going into the, the, the post session with the clinical trial patients and asking them what happened and they'll say, I can't, I can't describe it. It's, uh, I don't have words. So they're in awe. They all say, oh, it was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. And, and they'll come back months later and say, I think about this every day since. Then they liken it to childbirth. They liken it to death of a, of a parent. They're talking about a unity. They're talking about feeling connected. All things that describe meaning, that describe preciousness, and that it's this experience of awe and that there's something bigger than them. I think that it's too simplistic what Dr. Karhar is saying, that it simply sort of gets you unstuck from a canalized 
pattern and that it gets you unstuck from uh, from habits that you've learned. It's it's too simple because it wouldn't explain other mental disorders that aren't about being stuck. Alcoholism, borderline. Borderline is a is a mental disorder of a different form. It's not this hyper orderliness. Borderline is the opposite of that. They've also found that one year after one dose the patients are one standard deviation higher in the trait openness. So it's also the only time we we see such a personality transformation with a drug. It also he also talks Dr. Griffiths about being being calmer, being less afraid of discomfort that there's a psychological flexibility or more curious so that's the openness to to that's the openness trait more curious more engaged with life not such a tendency to become upset so that's decreased neuroticism and that's something that I work with patients all the time on this trying to be less neurotic. It's extremely difficult it's a, it's a, a very common problem in women and then he says that the patients attribute positive things to the experience that that then leads them to develop good habits so they'll they'll start afterwards with self-care routines so they'll eat better they'll stop smoking stop drinking have an exercise routine engaged with the engage better with their loved ones it's clear that this can be very therapeutically useful what's the most important and most interesting i found from these retellings is that they talk about gratitude is that after this experience where they feel awe they have less anxiety is this gratitude that they get to be a sentient being that we get to that that we're humble sense of humbling and awe that we get to take part in life in the way that we do that they then afterwards are more content to just live their lives and they also realize that everyone's going to die at some point that's also what Dennis McKenna Dr. Dennis McKenna says who's also done research on this he's everyone's going to die at some point and we're a part of this oneness so that takes away some of some of the anxiety so i'm going to show you this clip now from robin carhart harris who if i didn't mention that is the leading psychedelic researcher in the uk because i think he's just the perfect example of how how good research leads to bad therapy how are we able to see such This is, it feels like profoundly paradigm changing for how we understand and treat mental health disorders. Yeah, and I don't think that's exaggeration. Uh, it's a paradigm challenge. And the reason why it is, I think, is because this treatment does target the core of psychological suffering as it manifests into mental illness. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I've written a bit on that, this idea of kind of getting stuck in a rut, mm. not just in depression, where that's been said before, like a literal depression in a landscape, you know, like a hole. You get stuck in it, you fall into it, and it's hard to get out of. Um, but that can be true of a range of different disorders where you get stuck in some behavior mm -hmm. or thinking pattern, probably for reasons of psychological defense. Um, and uh, that's, that's the place that you're in. It's like a safety bunker. I sort of play with the analogy of, of under the threat of war, retreating to a bunker and you go there, you don't necessarily want to, but you go there to survive. And yes, it's a place of some degree of survival, but also despair. It's the next best. You'd much rather be out you know, in the fresh air but you go down into that bunker to get by. And that's how I think of things like depression, addiction. It's a retreat to some other space to, in a sense, get by. And people like Gabo Mate have written very eloquently on this idea of a kind of function, a sort of loaded but sort of perverse function to, to mental illness. It's tragic, but it's also serving in some way. So to rip it away to um, impulsively or recklessly could even be you know, very destabilizing for individuals. So the paradigm shift with this treatment is it sort of recognizes the suffering and, and perhaps the functional aspect of the suffering. And you take something like anorexia, you really need this kind of 
understanding. It, it promotes a, a deeper empathy, I think, because you kind of, you offer an attempt to hear why they've got where they are. Mm -hmm. It's kind of classic, classic deep psychotherapy at least. But you're twinning that like deep care with uh, the action of a drug. He's trying to put more palatable words onto something that's very clearly a spiritual and religious ex experience for people. He's very persistent in this insistence to make it rational, to make it a part of his secular worldview and his liberal worldview. Now we've talked about how wonderful the experience is, but is it a miracle drug? And this is why I think we should be really, really careful with touting this too much. Does that mean we want to give, you know, 50% of the population uh, this drug because that's how many people are depressed? Or now the, the global, they say 25%, uh, WHO um, says the, the global burden of disease is 25%. And then, you know, add to that the people who are suffering from alcoholism and uh, OCD, you know, this is quite a few people, you know. You don't want to give psychedelic drugs to all of those people because so they did a large scale s a survey uh, at John Hopkins where they asked people who had experience with taking psychedelic drugs. So not a part of a clinical trial. And 10% of them would endorse uh, harm to others or harm to themselves during the experience. You know, like drug running into the street, jumping out of the window, or, or attacking someone because of what they experience in the, in the moment. And another 10%, they report having lasting psychological damage after. And uh, among the trial patients, 30%, they report deeply fearful experiences. So, you know, is it a miracle drug with such amazing effects? you also have amazing downsides. And you can't just take a very small dose. It's, it's the mystical experience is dose dependent. So that's also very important. These, these life-changing <clears throat> mystical experiences, uh, they come from, from a significant dose. And if you don't have the mystical experience, then you also don't get the effect. That much is very clear. So let me repeat that. If you don't have the mystical experience, they report that you don't have the positive effect. What's also important is that the people who, these 30% who say they had deeply fearful experiences or that they were taken to hell, they also have the positive effect. And that just blew my mind that even if you are four hours in hell from this psilocybin trip, you will still change your life. So, but they're very careful. They do, they guide, they make sure that you're in a good setting, that everything is safe around you. They're with you the whole time. And that obviously reduces the risk of having a bad, a bad trip. You can see videos online uh, where, where people go for these ayahuasca trips and they're just puking their guts out the entire time. And it just looks like they're going to kill themselves or kill someone else. It's just, it all looks very unsafe and I wouldn't recommend it. We should also keep in mind that this is, we know that DMT is, is endogenous in the, in the brain. We have access to a form of, of DMT when broken down in trace amounts. We think that this is what's accessed in near death experiences when people come away and they, and, and they change their lives or at epileptic seizures. Some, some people with epileptic seizures have these religious experiences be, as a, pro, a prodromal phase. And I think that deeply spiritual people are able to access this more easily than the rest of us. And then we also hear about these young people who fall prey to or fall victim to to bad trips and a lot of them commit suicide uh, terrible things happen to them they estimate 10 percent so you have people who have a spiritual experience and they're able to function well and then you have all these people who have a mystical experience and then completely fall apart and then i have to ask what is the difference so we know that psychedelics have extremely positive results we know that it can be really dangerous. 
we know that uh, DMT is available in our brain. We know that it's shaped religion since the dawn of time and across cultures. It's been a part of, um, of religious rituals. And we know that therapists have, I mean, we've had evidence that spirituality is really advantageous in psychotherapy. That we've had that evidence for a long time. And this is why psychologists took all the these Asian spirituality techniques. Ever since the 70s, they've tried to sort of import those because it's more palatable than the Judeo-Christian rituals that we had traditions for already. So mindfulness, meditation, uh, yoga, these here and now therapies, they've been doing that for decades already them once and I, I went on this weekend death meditation course and I mean that Monday I've, I've never been born more depressed in my life honestly so I, I, I see how they practice spirituality in modern psychotherapy so you have therapists who've had a couple of courses uh, done it themselves a little bit and then they're trying to teach patients who are who have mental disorders about something that them, they themselves haven't been embedded in for very long. And to go back, in these meditators where you had that positive effect in those trials, they had to be long-term meditators. They had to be really good at it. And they had to prove that they went consistent. So it's not that I mean, mindfulness, meditation, uh, shamanic rituals, these are things that you have to be embedded in. It has to be part of the culture. It's not that you can just sort of do it for an hour and then you feel better. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what mindfulness and meditation looks like in modern psychotherapy. And again, I've been there myself, not impressed. This exercise is about noticing physical sensations. Turn your attention to what you can feel. Maybe you can feel a wall or a backrest against your back. Maybe you feel your clothing touching your arms or legs. Maybe you feel your feet resting on a rug or a carpet. What can you feel? Notice the texture of what you can feel. Notice the temperature. Notice where you feel any pressure or weight. How does it feel to tune in to your sense of touch? Noticing physical sensations is a simple way to ground yourself. Great work. Take a break from scrolling and join me. There are charlatans. They're really trying to sell something that they themselves don't really know. They want desperately to believe in it because it's cool. Again, it's more palatable than going to church, doing a prayer or, you know, having to clean for Pesach. This is easier. It it looks better. You can you can post it on Instagram and get likes and you can make a lot of money on it. They're trying to infuse spirituality into therapy. But one ends up happening is that the patients sit there for an hour saying um focus on your breathing imagine that you're a tree think about you think about yourself it's me 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 it increases this rumination and what it's supposed to do is decrease the activity in the default mode network as we've learned you're supposed to be eliminating the self-reflection and the difference is that the experience of psychedelics gives a feeling of gratitude. It's this awe, this thankfulness that I'm a part of this oneness. Thank you for, you know, making me aware, for making me the sentient being. And that is exactly what prayer in a Judeo-Christian framework is about. I've been at one of these uh, these uh, courses where they do in German, it's called Genuss training. It's like a, uh, you, you have to learn to enjoy the here and now. You have to learn to be present in the moment, mindfulness. And then you take like a, a bite of something and you're supposed to notice the color and notice how it feels against your skin and notice how it feels against your lips. And then and it's all about your subjective, focus on your subjective experience. Focus on how it feels to you. 
Well, when you say a prayer, it's thank you that I'm not lying in a gutter somewhere. Thank you for making me a human. Thank you for creating me in your image. Thank you. And it's also important that it's uh, something that you do without having to learn a completely new thing. Having to, because you sit there and meditate and what's really difficult is to, to actually get this feeling of I'm outside of myself. It's not so easy to just focus on your breath. It's not so easy to imagine that you're a part of a tree. That's for Instagram. That is not for life. This episode is also sponsored by Violet Nails, where I've been going to for years. It has a bunch of things from eyebrows and massages, mani pedis, and it's all, the result is always so smooth and elegant. And the, the best thing, I think, is that the treatment never lasts longer than planned, which is important when you have places to go and kids and all of that. You can sit in a massage chair while you get your treatment and listen to music. It's a really good time out. So go to the link below and check it out. So the spirituality that's been built into modern psychotherapy has just become new ways to give patients a way to focus on themselves, like self-care. And I've dealt with a lot of people who have neuroticism and what you do to decrease it, it's to direct the focus outwards. I tell them when they're in these spirals, go and do something, right? Nothing you're going to sit and think in that moment is going to help. It's going to make it worse. So you go, you do something for someone else. You go sit with your parents when you spiral. And then we make a list of things that they can go do once they notice I'm spiraling, right? You do go and that's when you do your exercise or you pick up the phone and you, you call a friend because that friend is in need. Not because, and this is where the therapists get it wrong. You're not call a friend because you want to talk about yourself. You call a friend that needs you to call them to help them. That's the difference. Or you create a project or paint a wall. A good example of this, and my husband had anxiety a couple of years ago. It was a pandemic. He lost his father. It was a terrible time for us with two small kids. And I told him to put on tefillin every morning. It's a, it's a practice in Judaism. So he started to put on tefillin every morning and it decreased his anxiety. And he still talks about that today, how, how that helped him through that anxiety a lot. And we were at, we were really, that, that was a difficult time. So, so if we go back to those, those young people who, who, who had psychological damage after trying, after having these mystical experiences, I, I think the difference is that they weren't embedded in a, in a religious framework. They were simply, they were exposed to a spirituality that they were too vulnerable, too fragile to handle. And yeah, people can say, People can say, oh, we've known about this this uh, benefit of spirituality and religion for a long time. We've noticed, you know, that's why doing these techniques and mindfulness and mindfulness, um, that's why we're doing, they're calling it different things. But bottom line, there are surveys that ask psychologists and psychiatrists about their religious affiliation, about their belief system, about their spirituality, and they're overwhelmingly non-religious, non-believers. This, for example, was done uh, by Duke University. They included 2,000 practitioners in the U.S. and they said psychiatrists were less likely to attend religious services frequently, believe in God or the afterlife, or cope by looking to God. In addition, psychiatrists were less likely to classify themselves as religious and more likely to classify themselves as spiritual but not religious. 33% versus 19%. So staggering numbers. <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing and again and again we see reports because they, they do surveys like this surveys like these all the time because they are aware of the overwhelming evidence that religion and spirituality has a beneficial effect we can also take a look at uh, pew research center 